They say, if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. In today's video, we are going to be doing a deep dive into the history of Montego Bay and St. James from 1655 to the beginning of tourism. At the end of the video, you're going to have a different perspective on our historical timeline. This is a two-part series and I will do part two based on the response to this video. 1655 seems to be a very important year. It is said to be the year when the English took possession of the island from the Spanish. However, one could argue against that, as the war between the two continued for almost five years after that. 1655 was also around the time when the Spanish freed enslaved Africans and Tainos who then relocated to the rugged interior of the island to escape the English invasion. They will later be known as the Maroons. Interestingly enough, it is also believed that the parish of St. James was formed between 1655 to 1664. At that time, it included the parishes of Trelawney and Hanover, so it was much bigger then than it is now. Even with that size, it was underpopulated with only 146 settlers in the parish in 1673, possibly because the settlers were scared of the Maroons who lived in the interior of the parish. The parish of St. James was regarded as one of the poorest parishes in Jamaica, so much so that between 1711 and 1712, the residents were exempt from taxation. Twelve years later, in 1724, a road act was passed and soon after, a road was constructed starting from Cave in Westmoreland to the west side of St. James. In 1728, a court of quarter sessions was created. This is where local court sessions were held four times for the year. During this period, traveling from, say, Spanish Town, where the seat of the government was located, to Montego Bay would have taken three to four days, as the few roads that existed were not in good condition. Now, we can't talk about the history of this area without talking about how Montego Bay came by its name. You see, in the 1600s, the area had a high population of wild hogs, which the Spanish slaughtered to get hog lard. Large quantities of lard were exported from there to other colonies in the West Indies and South America. It is believed that this is why, on an early map of Jamaica, the area was referred to by the Spanish as Bahia de Manteca, or Bay of Lard. In addition, it is widely believed by historians that Montego Bay was derived from this name. 1733 saw the passing of a bill regarding the construction of a church. Then, in 1738, barracks were constructed. In case you didn't know, this is a large building or group of buildings used to house soldiers. Now, church officials will later provide them with hunting dogs to help with capturing slaves that revolted. 1738 was also the year that Montego Bay was designated a free port. One year later, in 1739, Kojo, a leader of the Maroons, signed a treaty with the British. As a part of the treaty, the Maroons were given approximately 1,500 acres of land in St. James called Trelawney Town. I would like to point out here that there are two groupings of the Maroons, the Windward Maroons located on the eastern side of Jamaica and Leeward Maroons which were located on the western side of the islands in areas such as Trelawney Town in St. James and a compound in St. Elizabeth. According to this article, The History of St. James by the National Library of Jamaica, the parade in the town of Montego Bay was laid out by James Lawrence, a custos of the parish in 1755, and son of John, who came to Jamaica in the time of Cromwell, and next to the family of Barretts was the largest landowner. The land remained in their family from 1676 to 1910. James Lawrence named the square Charles Square after Sir Charles Knowles, governor of Jamaica from 1752 to 1756. In the same article, it says that the Rosal Great House was erected in 1760. In around 1774, the old courthouse was built. But here's the thing, that's what this article said. But yet another article said that the historic building was constructed in 1803 as a courthouse. 
and the St. James Municipal Corporation says on their website that the building was dedicated in 1804 and later completed in 1810. So I don't know which date to work with here. If you can give some clarity in the comments, please do. In 1775, the construction of the St. James Parish Church began and ended in 1782. I've seen two dates for this as well, but as usual, all my sources are linked in the description box and you can have a look at them for yourself after watching this video. An almanac for the year 1776 was created in Montego Bay. This is actually considered the third known book printed in Jamaica. I have a link in the description box to a site where you can learn a bit more about the almanacs created in and around that time. Of course, there was an increase in sugar plantations in the parish and soon enough as the planters wealth grew, so did the parish's wealth. So much so that in the 1780s, Montego Bay was considered as one of the wealthiest towns in the islands. Of course, second to Kingston. So we move from the poorest in around 1711 to one of the wealthiest in the 1780s. According to the National Library of Jamaica, the Second Maroon War began in 1795 when two Maroons were accused and convicted of stealing pigs and were subsequently flagged as punishment. It has been argued that the First Maroon War started in 1655, emerging from the fight between the Spanish and the British. After the English won, the Maroons, who assisted the Spaniards, of course, continued fighting with the English. In 1806, a wooden jail was built in the vicinity of the parade. Then, a belfry was constructed in 1811. A belfry is the part of a bell tower or steeple in which bells were housed. The jail was built to house runaway slaves, drunks, vagrants, and plantation slaves who did not leave town before the 3 p.m. warning bell. I guess that's why the belfry was constructed? Hmm. In 1823, the wooden structure was replaced with the brick and mortar you now see here. Eight years after that, in 1831, the Christmas Rebellion, otherwise known as the Baptist War, started. It was Samuel Sharp's plan that after the Christmas festivities were finished, the slaves would rebel, demanding pay for their work. However, some of the slaves got violence, setting cane fields and building the blaze. Soon, the violence spread to other plantations, but the rebellion was brutally suppressed by the plantocracy and the colonial government, who killed many slaves during the revolt and many more afterwards through judicial executions. The slaves were tried at the courthouse in 1832. Samuel Sharp was hung in the marketplace behind the courthouse right here in what is now known as Sam Sharp Square on May 23, 1832, along with 300 slaves. Now, this was one of the longest, largest, and most significant rebellions at the time. Many historians believe that though the rebellion did not directly lead to the freedom of slaves, it did somewhat accelerate the abolition of slavery. I want to backtrack a bit because according to this GIS article on January 1st, 1808, the abolition bill was passed. Trading in African slaves was declared to be utterly abolished, prohibited, and declared to be unlawful, yet slavery continued. However, emancipation and apprenticeship came into effect in 1834 and full freedom was granted in 1838. In 1837, one year before full freedom, the Creek Dome was erected to protect the mouth of the creek. Like, I knew these dates before, but for some reason I did not realize they were so close. Before I move on, I just wanted to say that I thoroughly enjoyed piecing this timeline together. If there is anything I missed out so far, please share that in the comments. Now, we are all here to learn together. And if you are enjoying the video so far, don't forget to leave a like, a comment, and share with those you think will also enjoy it. In 1845, Jamaica's railway system was constructed. 1859 saw the establishment of a cable communication system with Europe. Now, the abolishment of slavery did not mean that everything magically got better. It was a very difficult time for the newly freed men and women. 
Many of the English plantation owners left the island making way for new owners. However, not much changed as the system was still characterized by a small group of people controlling the majority. Between 1861 to 1865, the American Civil War also affected supplies entering the country, which made it a lot harder for everybody, mostly the poorer classes. In October of 1865, we had another rebellion that did not take place in St. James this time. The Morant Bay Rebellion took place in St. Thomas. On October 7th, Paul Bogle led a march to the Morant Bay Courthouse while it was in session. This culminated into a series of events that left over a thousand peasant homes burned to the ground. Over 430 people were executed or shot dead as the government brutally quelled the rebellion. Paul Bogo and George William Gordon were also hanged. In the years that followed, Jamaica would see social, constitutional and economic developments. We adopted the Crown Colony system, improved health, education and other social services, developed a proper transportation system through the construction of roads, bridges and railroads, and in 1872, the country's capital was relocated from Spanish Town to Kingston. Now moving on over to the 1900s and back to Montego Bay. In 1906, 68 years after full freedom, Dr. Alexander James McCarty donated his beach property to be used as a bathing club. The site became known as Doctor's Cave Beach because Dr. McCarty and his friends, who were mainly in the field of medicine, would use the beach which they entered through a cave. But unfortunately, that cave was destroyed by a hurricane in 1832. Sometime in the 1920s, an osteopath from Britain named Sir Herbert Barker visited the beach. He was apparently sick at the time, and after swimming in the water, his health returned. Soon after leaving, he published an article proclaiming that the water at the Doctor's Cave Beach had the ability to cure anyone who bathed there. This spread far and wide, and many rich and famous foreigners would flock to the beach to try this. Eventually, hotels were built in and around the area. And this, my friends, was the beginning of tourism in Montego Bay, now referred to as the tourism capital of Jamaica. That is the end of the video. I hope you learned something today. And if you did, please share that in the comments below. Don't forget to leave a like. As I said, leave a comment and share with friends and family members that you know will enjoy this video. Of course, as I said before, this is part one of a two part series. And depending on the reaction to this video, I will do a part two. See you in the next one.